Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today's a little bit different than other days because you're going to go out during the lab portion of class and take pictures. And all you have to do is go out and take those pictures. Uh, before you do that, we're going to do a little post about composition. You're going to find a sample image that you like and talk about what the uh, compositional techniques that were used because we'll talk about that today. Uh, and then essentially, today during lab, you're going to go get raw materials for next class. And so hopefully you guys had a good break on Monday. We have today you're collecting raw materials, and then next Monday we'll really start. We'll get into Photoshop and, and really get moving on things. Um, so today is about those raw materials. Now, I'm giving you the, lab, the, the balance of the lab portion today to do that. It may or may not be a good day to go out and photograph. You may decide that you want to take some photo photographs over the weekend, at night, et cetera. That's OK with me. Uh, but I'm giving you that chunk of time because I want you to actually use that amount of time to take a bunch of photos. Because you're going to learn a lot more if you go out and take photos than if you just randomly apply, you know, pick images offline and try to fix those or whatever. If you actually physically have to take the pictures, you'll learn a lot more about the process. So I'll go over that in a little bit more detail um, before I turn you loose today. But we're going to start today with an introduction to photography in general. Uh, and we're going to talk about photographic techniques and basic terminology. And that's all in the hopes that you learn something about photography. Because in the world of design, in the world of architecture, you're going to have to take pictures. You're going to need to use those pictures in your presentations. You want those pictures to be good. You have to learn how to post-process them, and then ultimately how to collage with them. So all of that's really important to, to get used to. Uh, so we'll go through, we'll start with the definition of terms so that when I talk about something like aperture, you have an idea of what I'm talking about as we go forward. So first off, we have what's called the camera body. And the camera body is essentially a light proof box that holds some kind of photosensitive media. So in the old days, when you had a camera with film in it, you had a, a light proof box, you put a piece of film inside, you expose light onto the film, it exposed the film, and then you develop the film later on. In our world, with digital cameras, it's essentially the same thing. The only difference is instead of having film in the camera, there's a sensor that reads the light, uh, which is really nice and convenient because you can screw up as many times as you want and just delete the pictures. When, when we start talking uh, about photography, this is the common you know, camera image, the digital SLR or whatever, though the truth is this is now most everybody's camera. And we live on these cameras, not those kinds of cameras. And so uh, it's actually been kind of interesting. I was reviewing the slides today. And I think next year I have to do uh, a big update because there's a bunch of slides in here that refer to real cameras because people used to take pictures with real cameras. And now so much of your pictures are relying on your phones that I think I have to update the slides to reflect more of what you guys are actually doing. But the principles are still the same. This is still a light proof box. It happens to be a lot more than that. but. We have a lens that lets in the light uh, and all the same stuff that I'm going to talk about as we go for forward here. Aperture is the size of the opening that lets light into the camera. And obviously, if we, if we look at our phones, the camera lens is smaller than if you look at a big digital SLR camera with a big old lens on it. But that is fundamentally the same. How much light can get into the camera is a function of the aperture of the camera lens. How open is that lens letting light in? Same thing happens with our eyes. You guys go into a dark room, this room for example, your, eye, your irises dilate, they get bigger to allow more light into your eyes so that you can see more. If we were to walk out in bright sunlight, there's too much light, your irises constrict down to allow you to see. Same thing happens in the world of photography. That is essentially what this aperture is. And why is aperture important? Well, aperture controls something called depth of field, which is the amount of the final image that's actually in focus. And so you've seen images like this one on the right, where the background is kind of blurry. This can be a great effect on your final image, because you can control what somebody's looking at versus what somebody's not looking at. Uh, and so understanding that this aperture has a direct control over this depth of field is really important. Now, of course, we have things like the iPhone 10 that deal with this in a kind of different way. So photography has evolved a bit. Uh, but essentially, this is the same general idea here. Um, we're looking for that blurred background in some photographic shots. The bigger that aperture, 
So the smaller the f number, which is how they refer to aperture, why it's inverted, I don't know. But the bigger the, the, the lens is, the bigger that iris is that's letting light in, the shallower the depth of field. And so why is this relevant? You're out, you're photographing a particular scene. If you know this principle, then you can adjust for this. You're photographing a flower, you want just that front petal to be in focus. You would want a very big aperture which means low f number. When I say f over 1.8, that's a very big camera lens. That's just how they refer to it. Uh, and in this example, it is. You can see that just a little bit of the petals are in focus. The rest of it's blurred out behind. On the other hand, on the image on the right here, we're taking a landscape shot on the California coast. We want the whole image to be in focus. We want the foreground of the little ice plant to be in focus. And we want the very background to be in focus, because it's a landscape type shot. The opposite here is true. We want a very small aperture, so a little bit of the light let being let in with a much different exposure. It's a much shorter exposure. And we're getting all of the scene in focus rather than having the background blurred out. So this is something that if you understand the principle of aperture and what it does, you can control whether you want the background to be blurred or not. And in some shots, it makes sense to have it blurred. And in others, it does not. So here it is in a little bit more graphic form. Sometimes it's easier to see this in a little bit more graphic form. So right here, we have the F16, not the fighter jet, the aperture here. Um, this is a very small aperture, a little bit of light coming into the camera. You can see that gray area right there. And as we look at the tape measure, a fairly large chunk of the tape measure is in focus. We can actually read the, 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 the numbers on the, on the tape measure. As you jump down here, on each level as we go forward, you can see that that aperture gets bigger. And as that aperture gets bigger, a smaller amount of the final image is in focus. As we get over here to the end, that's an f1.4, so really big lens, wide open. Very, very, very little is actually in focus of the tape measure. So just by varying this in our lens at the bottom here, we can control what's happening in our image. And that's a really important concept to understand. The next big thing is called shutter speed. My guess is most of you are already familiar with shutter speed. Shutter speed is essentially about time. It's how long is the camera allowing light into the photosensitive material. So how long do we have that sensitive material being exposed to light? Um, a typical exposure is 125th of a second. So it's really, really fast. We could get up to 1 1,000th one of a second. But we could also have multiple seconds, depending on what it is that we're trying to photograph. Why does this matter? Well, this changes a little bit about what we're, uh, what we're um, capturing in a particular scene. And are we capturing movement? Are we freezing movement? Or are we allowing movement to kind of blur through the image? So I'm going to use a bunch of examples here. And I'll flip through slides to show you. In this example, I have a photograph, um, but not one that I took, um, of a waterfall. And so here, this is our first 1 50th of a second. And we can, as we look at this waterfall, we can see very clearly little droplets of water. They're a little bit blurred. If we uh, increase that shutter speed even faster, 1 1,000th of a second, for example, we would freeze every individual little drop of spray. But as we go forward, um, we'll see that that's going to change. So here we are at 1 tenth of a second. So we went from 1 50th of a second to 1 tenth of a second. And you can see that all those individual drops that we could kind of see before have been smoothed out. And we're starting to get longer streaks of movement. The bottom of the pool, however, still has pretty easy to see ripples. We can still see the waves. They haven't moved too much. We have a fairly sharp definition there. As we move forward, this is a half second. You can see that it's becoming even wispier. There's very little individual droplets. It's just kind of a blurred motion. And the pool at the bottom is starting to smooth out. Those waves and those ripples have moved enough to start to smooth themselves out. As we go forward here, this is one second. All of the movement is very blurry. The pool is starting to get very smooth. We're not seeing any of those ripples anymore. And the one thing I will point out here is that in this particular image, in the upper right corner, the rocks are starting to get a little bit too bright. 
And that just is one of the side effects uh, of this long exposure. Here's another example contrasting 160th of a second on the same exposure versus a four second exposure. Both images are great, but they show very different things. The image on the left is freezing that action. We see the spray, we see all the individual drops as the wave hits that tree trunk. That's very, very different than the one on the right where everything's been smoothed out. So this is something to be aware of. If you were out shooting somebody in sports, for example, you would be shooting at a very high shutter speed trying to freeze the action. If you were photographing, uh, I don't know, traffic, uh, maybe you wanted it to be blurred. You wanted to photograph traffic at night such that you could get those light trails. You would want a long exposure to do that. So you want to think about what is your intended purpose of the photograph, and therefore, what should the shutter speed be? Similar to what should the aperture be? Do I want a, a shallow depth of field, or do I want a, a very big depth of field? ISO is called film speed. This is one of those things. Anybody have, you know, way back when did you actually have a real camera that you put film in? Few people, right? It's so funny. Like, I remember doing this. This was a big deal. Like, you would go and develop your film and whatever. Anyway, when you bought film, you could buy film based on its sensitivity. You would go buy ISO 100 film because it was reasonably standard. If you were going to go out and shoot something in high speed, you might get more sensitive material by buying ISO 800 film. It was more light sensitive. In the world of digital cameras, we don't buy film anymore. We just tell the sensor, be a little more sensitive, be a little less sensitive. Most of the time, your camera does it automatically and you don't even know about it. And that's a good thing. But it does result in this kind of thing. Anybody taking a picture like this? If you had an old school like Razer flip phone, this was the kind of image you always got. You guys are like, what's a razor? It's so funny. Like, life has evolved so much since then. Anyway, uh, in this particular example, you get a lot of this little speckling, this high noise. And this is because the sensitivity on the sensor inside the camera has been turned so high to expose the scene because it's so dark that it gets a lot of mistakes. And we get a lot of these little red and green and blue patches. If, however, you have a really good camera, this one's at an ISO of 1600, which is very sensitive, very low light, but we've got almost no noise in this particular image. So depending on the quality of the camera, the quality of the camera lens, you can actually increase this sensitivity quite a bit and still get a pretty good image. Why is this important? It allows you to shoot in lower light conditions. The darker it is, the better your image will be if you can increase the ISO. Here's an example. Um, you can see by the link that this was one of the Canon power shots back when that was a really popular camera, where they were comparing what the ISO did as it was increased to a particular image. So we see the first image at ISO 100. There's not very much noise. As we bump all the way up to 1600 or 3200, you can see that there's a lot of mistake pixels. There's a lot of pixels that aren't quite right. And so that's the side effect of increasing this ISO. White balance is another thing that applies only to digital cameras. Um, white balance is essentially, anybody ever taken a picture where it looks like you're underwater because everything's kind of blue? That's what white balance is. Let me show you, I, before well, I'll come back to this slide. It's this. The image on the left, the white balance is off. Everything seems really blue. It's kind of underwater. Something's going wrong with it. The correct image is on the right. What this white balance is, is sometimes your camera or your phone has trouble determining what color the natural light is. And when I take a picture of something that is white or light gray, is that kind of blue? Is it kind of yellow? What is true white? If we were really concerned about it, we can actually manually white balance a camera. We could hold up a white card that we know is white and take a picture of that first and then cross compare it when we took later uh, images to make sure true white is in fact true white. Uh, for the most part, our cameras now auto detect this really well. And this changes depending on where you are. If you're in bright sunlight, it's different. If you're in this room with these weird um, recessed fluorescent lights, that color of light is going to determine what white is. So it's going to vary. The good news is your camera tends to figure it out without you having to spend too much time. If, however, you get an image like the one on the left that's wrong, it's a really easy correction in Photoshop 
after the fact, or in Aperture, or in Lightroom, or, or any of the major photo processing software, which we'll talk about next class. So it's an easy fix, but it's something to be aware of. Bracketing is a term that refers to taking a series of photos, rather than just one photo, such that you're deliberately taking the photo that you think is correctly exposed, and then deliberately under and overexposing that particular photo. So we'll take three, five, or seven. It's always an odd number of, of uh, photos. And essentially, the middle one is what the camera or you think is the correct exposure. And then you're deliberately under and overexposing from there. Why is this valuable? It's useful in something that's called high dynamic range photography, which we'll spend a separate class and talk about. Anybody try to take a picture of a sunset and look at the picture afterwards and say, eh, it didn't really look like the sunset that I saw? Very, very common because our eyes see in something that's called high dynamic range. Our eyes and our brains can process really fast at changing between different um, dark and lightness levels. A camera, when you take a picture, is one fixed level. It is what it is. We're not seeing the shadows, and we're not seeing the brights at the same time, the way our eyes see it. So high dynamic range allows us to compile three images where we're correctly exposing the darks the mediums, and the lights, bringing them together into one single image so you can actually take a picture of a sunset, for example. We'll, we'll talk about this in far more depth as we go forward, but I like to at least introduce the concept of bracketing. Aperture and shutter speed have an inverse relationship. If you want to decrease the shutter speed, you need to increase the aperture. No surprise. If you want to decrease the shutter speed, if you want the shutter speed to go down, you have to make the camera bigger to allow the same amount of light into the particular lens. Exposure value. So if you went uh, and you took a, a true old school photography class, they would talk a lot about exposure value. And the reason that exposure value is valuable is because you would memorize a chart like this. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do this. But you would say, OK, I'm taking a picture of a sunset, or I'm taking a picture of the moon, or I'm taking a picture of whatever it is. Here I go. I'm in indoor artificial light. I'm taking a picture in a gallery. My exposure value is somewhere between 8 and 11. And you'd flip back to this chart, maybe, if I can flip back. Too many. You'd flip back to this chart, and you'd say, OK, it's between 8 and 11. And I want to be at a certain, let me draw on this slide instead of pointing. Hold on. OK, it was between 8 and 11, so somewhere in there. And I wanted to be at an uh, aperture of 2. I'd come down here, and I'd say, oh, great. I need to be shooting at 1 60th of a second. I'm not asking you to memorize this, but I want you to be aware that this is how you used to have to figure out what the correct exposure was. My goal for you is to just go from going in full auto mode on your camera to being a little bit better than that, so a little bit more specific. So I won't ask you to memorize this, but I like to introduce it as a concept um, and certainly something that you can be aware of. Exposure compensation is a little bit different than exposure value. They sound similar, but they're different. And anybody on their phone ever touched the image and then dragged up and down to make the image darker or lighter? That's what you're doing here is exposure compensation. You're saying the camera thinks this is the correct exposure. But you at your eye say, no, it's not quite white. Let me make it a little bit darker. Let me make it a little bit lighter. You're compensating the exposure. So you're going from what the camera thinks is correct, which is 0, to deliberately darkening or lightening that particular image. So here's our example here. Our standard exposure is in the center. On the left, we've deliberately darkened the image. On the right, we've deliberately lightened the image. And that's going to vary depending on the image. So it's not a prescriptive thing. You're not going to automatically darken every single image. Uh, but it's something to be aware of. So some notes on lighting. Noon is always the most even time for light. It's the most uh, consistent when you're photographing colors. The colors will represent themselves best because the lighting is very even. Most photographers, on the other hand, like to get up early in the morning or shoot late in the evening right in that twilight time frame. You've seen lots of architectural shots. You, you look at an architectural record. There happens to be one sitting here. I bet as I flip through this, several of the pictures that will come out will be, yep, here we go. This is live, unplanned. I haven't even looked at this magazine. If I can get the image, there we go. Right, classic. 
Twilight scene. Lights in the building. No surprise. They like this time because you get lots of different lighting conditions. You get long shadows. And be, it, it's an exciting uh, type of image to take, which is a good thing. Interesting side note to the story. So I was on a field, um, like a field study school in Peru. Uh, this was when I was in an undergrad. It was actually the end of my undergrad. It was the summer after undergrad. Um, and I went to instruct on laser, laser scanning and uh, panoramic photography, which was my passion at that point in, in my life before I had kids and realized that I didn't have time for it anymore. Um, so I went down there and we did this field school. We were at three weeks. We were investigating this site in Tambo, Colorado, Peru. Uh, it is very dry desert in this particular area. It's not up in the, the highlands of Peru. It's down in the desert. And this particular site had some of the best preserved wall paintings um, in, in Peru, uh, in, the, in the, the ruins. And so anyway, we went down there to try to document this, this particular place. And it was a team of people that were architects or architecture students and a team of people that were archaeologists or archaeology students. And it was really interesting because we all had very different philosophies. The architecture students were far more interested in the early morning when we first got there and the late evening right before we left. And in the middle of the day, we were all like, let's just take a nap. The archaeology students, on the other hand, didn't really want to do anything in the morning and didn't really want to do anything in the evening. And they went nuts right at about lunchtime. And they were trying to take all these pictures. And it's because we had different purposes. We were trying to, as the architecture people, document the beauty of the site. Long shadows, show the wall relief, that kind of stuff. The archaeology students wanted to try to document exactly the right color of these walls. This red is the actual red. So they were far more concerned with the most even lighting they could possibly get, which was at noon. So depending on your intent of the photographs, you're going to be doing one or the other of these. And it's important to recognize that they're different. So let's talk a little bit about dim digital image file types. Most of you are already familiar with the JPEG. It doesn't even matter anymore that it's the Joint Photographic Experts Group, like, like any of us care anymore. Um, but it's the most common file type for digital pictures. And it's not a surprise that it's the most common file type. Um, essentially, what we've done or what we, I don't know that I had any say in any of this, but whatever. Uh, wh what the JPEG does is it takes the image and it strips out some of the information to compress it so that it's smaller. So it groups like images, like colors together, makes color regions, makes the overall image smaller. And we're getting a compression somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 1. So instead of having a 10 megabyte file, you'd have a 1 megabyte file, which is great if you're trying to store it on your phone or someplace where you don't have a lot of storage. This is also really important 10 years ago when storage was really expensive. When I bought a 1 gig flash drive and I paid 120 bucks for it. Right? And now a 1 gig flash drive is like, why? You could just somebody could give it to you on the street corner. Like it, it's irrelevant because it's so small. So as we are getting more uh, comfortable with space, as space on your computer is getting cheaper and cheaper, the likelihood of needing to use a JPEG really goes down. It's just not something that matters so much. We're, we're comfortable with higher quality images that take a little bit more space. And we're actually seeing a movement away. Apple's kind of leading this movement away from using the JPEG as the default image format. We're moving into a higher quality image format. Uh, did I skip one? I thought I... Yeah, PNG. We will use JPEGs in this class. We will use PNGs in this class. PNG is the Portable Networks graphic. It allows for lossless compression. So we get compressed file, a little bit smaller than a full-size file. But um, we're not losing any information. We're not throwing away information. We're keeping that high-quality information. Uh, it's the most common lossless, lossless compression format. So it's very easy to use, very easy to work with. And the big one down here at the bottom is that it supports transparency. And in a few classes, we're going to start working in Photoshop. We're going to isolate objects. We're going to get rid of backgrounds and have just people cut out, for example. I'm going to teach you how to do that. And when we do that, we're going to save it as a PNG to be able to preserve that transparency behind the, the object. And that allows really easily to collage in people or, or other things into a particular scene. So this is something that's very, very valuable to us. And we will end up using it extensively in this class. A TIFF image is 
a little bit in between. We can have lossless compression. We can have lossy compression, depending on how it's set up. Um, it's generally re reserved for really big images. If we had an HDR image that was tone mapped, um, this, that's a high dynamic range image that was post-processed. Sorry, I'm trying to translate what I just said. It's a high dynamic range image that's the three images have been combined into one. We're getting one very large image with a lot of information in it that would typically be saved as a TIFF image. We'll talk about that when we get to high dynamic range. The last type here is an image format called RAW. And a RAW image is something that some cameras support. Most phones don't support it, though Apple's uh, new format that they just introduced uh, in iOS 11 is kind of a hybrid of it. It's, it's a little bit in that, in, in that vein. The idea of a RAW format is this is all the information that's been captured by your camera. So anything that the camera captures goes into that image. We haven't compressed it. We haven't done anything to it. And the advantage here is that we can then open it in something like Photoshop, and we could do a bunch of corrections. If we made a mistake, and sometimes this is easier to show you, the image on the left, I made a mistake when I shot it. It was overexposed. And so the white areas, by overexposed, essentially what I mean is that areas here in the white, they're kind of just turning all white. I've lost detail in that section. So that's too bright. If I try to correct it, Here's the correction image. I darkened it up, but I still have big white patches. Like I didn't get the detail back. This was a JPEG file type in both cases. If, however, the first image was a raw file type, there it is, same problem on the overexposed. I come back over here to correct it, and you can see that this is all back to having full detail. All the little peeling paint is back. So the overexposure can be corrected because all of the information that the camera captured is still there. We haven't stripped out any information. So the RAW can be really beneficial in your post-processing. So if you have the ability to shoot RAW, it's a good idea. The sacrifice here is the size. So we're back to a JPEG is 1 tenth the size of a RAW image. So if we have a 1 megabyte JPEG, it would be a 10 megabyte RAW file. A little bit heavier to work with, but again, space is cheap at this point. So it's not quite as big of a deal as it used to be. A uh, little bit more about your camera. The, the images here are for big cameras, but they apply to your cell phone just as well. Uh, essentially, this is like a chip that would be inside your camera. It contains different color filters across the chip. When light hits these three colors, uh, it tells the camera, I'm seeing this particular color, I'm seeing this particular color, and therefore we get the little pixels that make up an image. I'm simplifying here to some degree. We get all of those little pixels. You've heard cameras, or you, maybe in the old days, uh, you used to hear about camera megapixels. How many million pixels is your image? That has to do with the sensitivity of the sensor and how many little dots of color make up your final image. Once we get that light coming into the camera, it gets translated into a digital format and then stored in a digital format. These were some of the slides that I was looking at saying like, yeah, I don't think anybody even owns these kinds of cameras anymore. Right? So we're just going to kind of gloss over these next three or four slides um, because it's so irrelevant in this day and age. Digital SLRs still exist. Uh, if you go to a wedding, you're going to see a wedding photographer with one of these cameras. If you uh, hire somebody to shoot baby photos of your newborn, they're going to shoot with this kind of a camera. Uh, if you go to any kind of professional photo shoot, they're going to shoot with this kind of a camera. The reason that people shoot with this kind of a camera is because the lenses are really, really good. They're big lenses. They have a lot of glass. They can let a lot of light in. And you get really crisp, crisp, clear images. The problem with these kinds of images is the camera's really big when you're carrying it around. Okay, I have one of these. I used to shoot in it all the time. This is a whole lot more convenient when it's stuck in my back pocket. They're also at the point where your phone camera is so good, it's not that much different than using one of these. So I'm willing to sacrifice that for this. Uh, so it's something to be aware of uh, as we go forward. So I'm not going to talk about the, the, the details on it. So depending on your camera, depending on uh, your phone, you may have the ability to go into various modes on your camera. Some of these modes are easier to get to than others. Um, few highlights for, for these modes. 
if you have access to, uh, for example, a portrait mode, essentially what the portrait mode is going to do is it's going to make the aperture big and therefore blur the background. So you get something in focus in the foreground and a background that is blurry. This is the same as portrait mode on the iPhone, for example. That's going to be something if you want a foreground that's sharp and a background that's blurred. So be aware that that's your target, if you can find that kind of a mode for that. The opposite, right below it here, is the landscape mode. This means the opposite. We want everything to be in focus, the things that are in the foreground, the things that are in the background. So if you want everything to be in focus, you're looking for something like a landscape mode to try to get everything in focus, which would be on the iPhone, for example, it would be the opposite of portrait mode. It would be your standard uh, photograph. Sports mode, if you have it, increases the shutter speed so that you're freezing motion rather than having a long exposure. The opposite of sports mode would be your night mode, if you have it. Most of the time, they don't have it uh, on phones anymore. But the night mode is the long exposure. And that allows you to take uh, very low light level uh, images at night, for example. There's usually some kind of a panorama mode that's available now. We will talk extensively about panoramas later on in the class. I'll do a whole lecture on panoramas. Um, but typically, there's a panorama mode on your phone that lets you stitch a bunch of images together. Uh, the rest of these are more for your true camera. Down here, these are all your semi-manual modes, which are great if you have a really good camera and you want to say, I want to shoot in this aperture, adjust the rest for me. Um, and so that can be a beneficial way. All of these are better than shooting in just whatever the standard auto mode is. So you're taking a little bit more time and thinking about how you want these things done and what the images should look like. Uh, like I said, I'm going to go through these uh, rather quickly because they're kind of irrelevant at this point. Uh, you used to have to think about how big was the little card that went into your camera. Now it's all on your phone and it gets uploaded to the cloud, so it kind of doesn't matter anymore. So we'll skip through that. What to carry? Well, carrying this is really easy because <laughs> I don't have to think about much. So that just goes in your pocket. You don't have to worry about it. If, however, you were bringing a big camera, you'd be thinking about all the other stuff, like the tripod or the camera bag and, and that sort of thing. And you have to be aware that weather happens. And it will rain. Uh, this was uh, up at Machu Picchu. Anybody been to Machu Picchu before? Yeah. Machu Picchu, maybe? No? The other one? OK. Um, Machu Picchu is fantastic, well worth it. It was not on my bucket list. I did it kind of by accident, but it was awesome. So totally worth it if you end up in Peru. Uh, but it was pouring rain the day that we hiked there. So it happens. And of course, we had cameras and laptops and all the rest of it and had to deal with it. So let's talk through compositional techniques. And if you don't take anything else away from this uh, lecture today, I hope that you really understand compositional techniques and why this can really matter. I will talk extensively about photographic compositional techniques right now. But all of these techniques still apply if and when you get to presenting in poster form on an architectural board, for example, or you're doing your layout for your lecture series poster. All of these compositional techniques still apply and are still very, very valuable. So the first technique is called telling a story. And the idea here is that you're trying to capture a mood, or you're try it usually it involves mood and or light in a particular scene, such that you're trying to capture what's going on in this, in this space? What makes this space special? Um, it, there, there's usually some elements of the, of the photograph that allow somebody to want to get into the photo, to want to step in and experience what that photo is about. So let me show you some examples. So this is in St. Peter's in Rome. And the idea here is that that light is coming through. You're in a church. That light is powering through. And people are congregating right where that light is. This was a photograph I took long before I had any real skill as a photographer. Uh, and it was in like a, the old days where I had like a three megapixel camera. So bear with me a little bit. But the idea is still the same. You're capturing the light. You're capturing the dust. You have an understanding of what this space is. And you're trying to invite people into experiencing this particular type of space. 
Here's uh, a picture of the Swiss Alps in hiking. And again, I would adjust this composition if I had this photograph to take over again. Uh, but the idea here is that there's a little trail. And that trail starts roughly where the camera is. And it works its way all the way along that ridge there. And if you keep following it, it continues all the way through the photo and around that corner. So the idea here is that there's something in the image that invites you, the viewer, into wandering through the image and keeps you looking at the image. And that's a positive thing. The longer you can get somebody to look at a particular image, the better. Another example here, not one that I took, where we have this really strong path element that's bringing you toward the tree, but the path disappears before you get to the tree and, and weaves its way around. But that action brings you, the viewer, into the, the scene and gets you involved in this particular composition. Another example, nah, this one's too dark, I'll skip it. Next type is called symmetry. You guys are all familiar with symmetry. Similar on one side uh, as to the other. This is really easy to do to create something that's symmetrical. But the key here is to find something that breaks the symmetry and makes that stand out. What's, what doesn't belong? It's the which one of these things doesn't belong category. So here's an example on the Brooklyn Bridge. Photograph taken dead center on the bridge. Everything's symmetrical on both sides. The cables are symmetrical. The structure of the bridge is symmetrical. But then you have all the people that are just on one side of the bridge. It happens to be that the left side is the bike lane, uh, in looking at it this way, and the right side is the people lane. But it's still, that activates the photograph. It's the thing that doesn't belong. It's the thing that's strange about this particular symmetry. So when you think about a symmetrical image, if those people had gone away and it was just the image, it's rather boring. But if you put those people in, it activates the scene and makes it an interesting composition. Another example here where we've got symmetry, but we've got the pile of debris on one side and not on the other side. So it's one thing that's out of place. And that's an important part of a symmetrical composition. Radial is that you're starting at a center strong focal point. And everything radiates outward from that strong focal point. This one is very circumstantial. It has to just happen. It's hard to go out and say, I'm going to set up a radial composition. Um, and so it might be something like this. This was an ice cave in Switzerland where you've got this tension between those two melted points that's creating that strong center focal point, And everything else radiates outward from that particular uh, place. Another example here, looking down a tunnel, we've got that center focal point, and everything is radiating from there. I love this image. It's a great one of the hot air balloon, where we've got all the little uh, seams that are coming out from that strong focal point. But in addition to that strong radial focal point, the shadows of the people really activate this particular composition. So the fact that the people are there and we're seeing their shadows, it really helps. Diagonal. These are strong diagonal elements that are part of your, pro your composition. Might be something like this. This was a macro shot close up of, of sand on a beach. This here's the book loading center zone uh, down below the, uh, the pond, kind of near the pond here. Uh, strong diagonals in contrast to the square concrete seams. Strong diagonal here of the train tracks. You get the idea. Next one is overlapping layers. And this is that something leads to something which leads to something else as you go deeper into the photograph. So it's, it's one layer into the next layer into the next layer. So first example that I have here is in that mud uh, Tombow, Colorado in Peru. And the idea here is that you've got the first image or the first frame of this particular image is the doorway. Into the, beyond that doorway, we've got a niche and a window. Beyond that window, we get to the next level. So we're going through a successive series of levels or layers in that particular composition. This just gives you some perspective of what the, the structures look like. You can see some of the preserved paint on the walls uh, there as well. This one, which is just a landscape uh, photograph, really works with this layering uh, idea nicely. I'm going to point it out. So we've got the first foreground, which is the darker area of grass here. Then we move into the next layer, which is the lighter area of grass right here. Then we move into the next layer, which is the, the pond. 
Then we move into the next layer, which is the other side of the pond. Then we move into the next layer, which is this body of water. Then we get to the mountains. And then finally, we get to the horizon and the clouds. So there's all these layers. It would look different if it was just a long, grassy field. So the fact that all those layers exist start to really enhance this composition uh, altogether. Next one is rule of thirds. All of the compositional techniques are important. Rule of thirds is by far the easiest to do, and it's the best way of getting good images. So if you don't do anything else, just always think rule of thirds. In fact, most cameras, including your phone, will allow you to put a grid on the phone or a grid on the screen to help you with the rule of thirds. As long as you align elements along the rule of thirds, you will get good, strong compositions. So let's look at some examples here. So here's an image of the Statue of Liberty. I position the Statue of Liberty a third of the way over from one side, two thirds from the other side. So it's not centered anymore. It's slightly off center. Furthermore, oops, maybe. Apparently it doesn't like me. Hold on. OK, I crashed. Sorry. Try that again. There we go. The base, or the land, is roughly a third of the way up. So we're positioning that at the third lines. Let me show you some more examples. Another example here. It doesn't always fit perfectly. In this particular example, there should be a little bit more water uh, below the boat. But there, the bow of the boat is about a third of the way over. The boat itself is about a third of the way up. Taking pictures of people. The most common way that people take pictures is they center the person in the middle of a photograph. Always happens. Most of the pictures you see on Facebook, person is always dead center. If you follow the rule of thirds, you really activate the scene, not the person. And it really changes what it looks like to have somebody in a particular uh, environment. So here we have a picture. Um, this happens to be my father-in-law tying his shoe. And we're taking a picture such that he's a third of the way over. And we've got 2 thirds of the way on this side. Furthermore, his eyes are roughly a third of the way down the image. So what we get out of this is we get that he's sitting there, but that there is more context. He's tying a shoe and he's looking off at something. We get more interested because he's looking at something. There's space around him. We see the context of this particular photograph. This image still follows the rule of thirds, but it doesn't work. So there we are. There's our third. And there's our third. Same rules apply. But he's looking not toward the space. You guys see how this really doesn't work? So you have to pay attention to which direction somebody's looking if you're going to follow this rule. So don't just say, well, this, this fits. It's the rule of thirds. It must be a good composition, because it's not. We're getting information that we don't need. The stuff that behind him isn't important. This could work as a rule of thirds. It also could work as a strong diagonal, depending on which way you want to look at it. Uh, but you're freezing that frame at a third of the way over. Another example here, it's roughly a third of the way over. Here's another example of the, the typical hiking photo. And so if, if this were taken by the, the, the non-informed, the, the two of us, this was me and a friend of mine, the two of us would have been dead center. And we wouldn't have had any context about the mountains or where we had been, just that here's a picture of the two of us. By taking it on this rule of thirds, where we're a third of the way over on the page, we get, hey, this is us. And look at where we hiked from. It's a very different image. And it's a far more interesting image to show somebody. So just by following that rule of thirds, we get a lot more out of it. Same thing here, coast of California. This is up at Sea Ranch. Uh, the big cliff face and whatever is about a third of the way over, the big dense foliage, et cetera, and the lower rim is about a third of the way up. And furthermore, the upper rim is about a third of the way up. So compositionally, this is working really nicely into the rule of thirds. Framing is using a strong object in the foreground to frame something in the background. 
So something like this, for example, this is in Pompeii, Italy. We're looking at the Bay of Naples, and we've got right here the strong circular window oculus. That is then framing the view out toward the Bay of Naples. So we're using one foreground element to frame something in the background. Patterns and repetition, this is another fun one. If you pay attention to patterns, you can get really interesting things, especially when the pattern breaks. So my first example here is the pattern of all these hotel windows. And so you've got this repetition of all these balconies. And then there's one swimsuit hanging on the balcony, and it breaks the pattern. Now, would it be better if that swimsuit was slightly over? If I, if, I were, if I were trying to set up this image, I would take the swimsuit and I would put it right here. Because that falls roughly at the rule of thirds. Right There's the rule of thirds. It would have been a better composition. I didn't take the image. But it's still the thing that breaks the repetition and breaks the pattern. So that's another thing to keep in mind if you're using patterns and repetition. I need to find some other better slides of pattern. That's the best example. Um, but here's another example where we have a series of repetitive elements. All of these arches and columns repeat themselves. And there's the blurry figure that's walking through the middle. That breaks the pattern uh, on that particular image. Another example here of the, the grates. I don't like this one so much. Uh, but the snow is the piece that is breaking the repetition. So depending on how you have it set up. OK, so those are all my slides for right now. Um, what you're going to do for today, and you'll see this on your little handout, um, under exercise 103. Part one, you're going to do in here in the classroom before you leave today. You're going to look through, uh, you're going to browse the internet, and you're going to find an image that you like. And then you're going to write a paragraph about what is good about it, what is compositionally good. You're going to try to basically outline why is this image so spectacular. And the hope is that you pick a spectacular image. Um, so there it is. You may also, I like to point this out, many times compositionally there might be more than one thing. You might be, this is rule of thirds, but it's also pattern and repetition. Or this is rule of thirds, but it's also framing. It's a rule of thirds, but it has a strong diagonal. So there can always be multiple uh, that are in there. You're going to write a brief paragraph that explains it. Uh, and then you're going to post that image. You're going to download and post that image. Please also post a link to the image so that somebody could find the image if they were the wanting to find more information about it. Part two through three basically mean I want you to go out and I want you to photograph things. And I'm going to ask you today to photograph mostly on campus, but then you'll have some homework to photograph off campus. These are designed to give you uh, raw materials when we move into Photoshop. So next class, when you come in on Monday, we're going to start talking about Photoshop. I'm going to give you basic techniques for post-processing in Photoshop such that you can make your images look better. If you just pick images that are online or if I just give you sample images, you won't learn nearly as much as if you take your own pictures and make your own mistakes. So I'm going to ask you to go out. And when you go out, I'm going to ask you, and this is written down on part three, but I'm going to go through it right now, for five photographs of campus buildings. Pick the most interesting to you. I'm going to ask you for five images of people walking, congregating, singing, sitting, I don't know, people. Okay? Be aware that sometimes people get really cranky if you take their picture. So technically speaking, you're supposed to go up and ask somebody, hey, would you mind if I take your picture? Right? Many times people are just like, hey, I'm taking a selfie, but I'm actually taking a picture of you. you know, that works too. Um, but be aware that do, people do get kind of cranky about that. Um, maybe take pictures of your friends because they're not going to get mad at you. Might be nice. Uh, so I want five pictures of people. When you take pictures of people, make sure you include the whole person, not just you know, cro don't crop their legs. I want the whole person. And this is something we'll end up using later on in class. I want five detailed images of textures or patterns. Remember thinking about the thing that breaks the pattern. I want five photographs taken from unexpected angles. I'll leave it at that. You guys figure out what that means. It's meant to be vague. I want four macro or close-up photographs of something. I want you to attempt to do one bracketed set of Im images. Remember, this is the image that is correctly exposed, deliberately under and overexposed. So if I were doing it on my iPhone, which a lot of you guys will be doing it on, this would be set the phone on something so it's nice and stable, take a picture, then drag the little 
exposure compensation up and down. So do the one up to make it lighter, take a picture, drag it down to take a, darken it, take a picture. Set your phone on something so it's nice and stable. Don't just try to snap it and keep the same. It'll help when we align them later on. We will use those as part of the high dynamic range set of images that we'll process. If yours don't turn out, I will have samples for you to work on when we get to that class. So if yours don't turn out, don't, don't worry, but I'd rather have you attempt to do it yourself. Uh, the next one is a handheld set of panorama images. So yes, I'm very, very well aware that you have an app uh, in your camera thing that lets you do a pano, where you basically start here and go like that. Okay, That's fine. You can do that. However, I want you to take a bunch of images that overlap because I want to teach you how to stitch images together. So take five or six, seven images that have pieces that overlap. Doesn't matter how perfectly they're done, but just try to make some that overlap. Again, I'll have samples for that particular um, lab exercise when we get to it if your images don't work or you can't figure out how to stitch them together. It's a skill that you need to have when you're working in Photoshop. So it's just part of teaching you the process. Um, I want you to take one self-portrait, which is always kind of entertaining. And then I want you to take 25 or more images of your choice. They don't have to be on campus. They can be at home. They can be wherever. But I want you to just take some more photos. Truthfully, I ought to say you know, 100 plus images, because it's not a bad thing to take more uh, images. This is moving in the direction of uh, your first assignment, which you'll get next class where you're going, to be, you're going to actually be selecting a really premium image that you've taken and then doing post-processing on it and turning it in. Um, so the more images that you have to pick from, the better off you're going to be. Uh, I have it on here a challenge for you as well, um, which I've always been tempted to make an actual assignment because I, I love the idea of it. But that is to take 30 different images of your mailbox. And 30 images sounds like, oh, I could take 30 images of my mailbox. But you find after maybe 15 that you there are no more images that you can possibly think of. And so it starts to make you really have to think about how do I take more images of my mailbox. So if you want that challenge, you can do it. Uh, but it isn't required. It's just a challenge. Question? What if we have a you can't do that challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, so that's where we're going today. Um, after you make your post for part one, you're free to go take your pictures on campus. You do not have to come back here and check in. If you choose not to take your pictures on campus because you're like, oh, that doesn't matter, you still have to do them at some point. So I'm giving you the time now so that you can actually go concentrate on doing it. I'm not doing it as homework because I don't want you to rush through it. I want you to actually take your time and take good images. When you take your images this weekend or tonight or when you get home or whatever, take your time and take good images. There's nothing worse than trying to pick through images where most of them are blurry and you can't, oh, that was a great image, except it's not really that good because it's blurry or it's overexposed or there's a problem with it, et cetera. So try to take good quality images. You can correct most things in Photoshop, but you can't correct a blurry image. If it's blurry, it's blurry. There's nothing you can do about it. So be aware of that. Are there any questions? No? OK. So I'll let you guys go. Make sure you make your first post. And then um, you're free to go take the rest of your pictures. Come back on Monday. Make sure that you bring all of your images on Monday. If you took them on your phone, make sure you have some way of getting them from your phone to your computer. You could email them to yourself. You could, you could do whatever. If you want to do it ahead of time at home, because you have your home computer and it's easier to get your photos off your, your um, phone when you're at your, you know, on your home computer, do it ahead of time, put them on your flash drive, bring them in. We are going to work with those images next class. So we need to have those images. Make sense? All right. <laughs>